So welcome to everyone and good evening. I'm Paul Carice. I am the director of this new school department at Arizona State University, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. It's my delight and honor to welcome all of you to this two-day conference, two and a half counting this evening's events. Uh, this is the sixth event in a year-long series of lectures on free speech and intellectual diversity in higher education and American society. School is in its inaugural year, uh, but we have started uh, quickly, and we also think uh, substantively to address the mission of the school, both the internal, so to speak, curricular academic mission of, of building a department, a curriculum, a major, a minor, and then our broader civic education mission with events like this. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is sponsoring the whole series of events this year, fall and spring, with two of our ASU partners, the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. And we're delighted to have gathered for this two-day conference such a distinguished group of scholars, writers, and university students to speak at the conference over these next few days on two different campuses of the university, tonight and tomorrow at the Tempe campus and on Saturday at the new law school uh, building at the downtown Phoenix campus. I will say that it's an auspicious beginning that we convene on George Washington's birthday, February 22nd. Uh, we do convene in a fiercely factional time, as Washington might have said, when many Americans are partisan with an irrational frenzy and so we would do well to recall his counsel from his farewell address addressed to his friends and fellow citizens. Counsel about moderating our single-mindedness and our partisanship. And we also might consider adopting his ideas of civility in our public conduct generally. For Washington seems to have imbibed the intellectual heritage from the Latin that connects our English words from civilization to citizen, to city, to civility. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is convening across the year and during these two days, experts on free speech and intellectual diversity, and also a broader array of civic and in intellectual leaders in American life to explore the wave of heated debates and clashes on American campuses about freedom of speech, civility, diversity, and inclusion. Recent episodes of violence, and the widespread concern about a narrowed range of discourse on many campuses are vitally important issues for educators, but also for American politics and our civic fabric. These university episodes reflect and reinforce the angry polarization and civic discord that has grown in American life in recent years. Our school therefore plans to collect all the presentations from this year's series, the individual lectures, the dialogue events, and also this two-day February conference into a single published volume. And as you might have detected, we are also happy to be collaborating with Arizona PBS on recording all of these events, which they are editing into their own series entitled Free Speech Challenge of Our Times. All of the events are archived on our school's website, but we also have a link to the episodes of the PBS series available on our website. So just a word uh, more about the mission of this new academic department, this school at Arizona State University, and then I'll introduce Professor Hayward. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is dedicated to reviving the crucial link between civic education and liberal education in order to prepare thoughtful leaders for civil society and for public service. We offer courses on great works and great debates of civic, economic, political, and moral thought supplemented by internships, leadership experiences beyond the classroom, and recently, we're uh, soon, we're taking a group of students to India, uh, and, and also public events like this to provide experiences about leadership and statesmanship, all as a foundation for both understanding and practicing leadership in 21st century America and our globalized world. We also think that a return to some fundamental ideas and debates in the classroom and beyond might provide a broader and calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. Tonight we begin an extended dialogue across several days 
that we believe captures a breadth of views about both free speech and intellectual diversity in America today, in the university and in America generally. We have here on the program those who advocate speakers should be disinvited or not have been invited in the first place to universities. We also have those who have been disinvited and confronted or even attacked. I want to mention one person in particular who's not on the official program, but Professor Allison Stanger from Middlebury, University, uh, Middlebury College excuse me, uh, spoke last week as, as a, one of the regular events in our series paired with Lucia Martinez Valdivia from Reed College in a dialogue about their experiences with being physically confronted uh, by students and in Allison cases, Allison's case attacked um, as part of, in, in the case of Reed College, teaching courses long in the curriculum and in the case of, of Professor Stanger and Charles Murray, uh, a, a, a scheduled speaker event at, at Middlebury College. So we have here to, in, in these two days a range of people, those uh, who, who are closer to one edge in favor of robust freedom of speech on campuses and beyond, and those who make the serious argument that speech on campuses ought to be restricted or limited for various reasons. We've set up a conversational space, we believe, so that all of us can pursue the truth, try to get closer to a true and sound understanding of these complicated, even vexing issues. We have a mix of speakers across the two days and, and uh, speaker settings from panel discussions, but also some keynote and plenary lectures. And because our two lectures tomorrow from distinguished law professors will lean, in my view, toward the side of restraints or limits on speech in the university setting, we thought we should make space in our opening dinner for a lively defense of robust freedom of speech and discourse from a scholar who regularly has been a minority conservative voice, intellectually and politically conservative voice at major universities in America. And to your delight, our speaker has agreed to take questions after his remarks. And so this evening, we should have a very good start to our exchange of ideas. And so we are delighted to have with us Stephen Hayward, senior resident scholar in the Institute of Governmental Studies at the University of California, Berkeley and also a visiting lecturer at the University of California Berkeley Law School. In the past decade, Professor Hayward has been the Thomas Smith Distinguished Fellow at the John M. Ashbrook Center at Ashland University, where he directed Ashbrook Center's new uh, program in political economy. Also in the previous decade, he was the Weyerhaeuser Fellow in Law and Economics at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC, a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute in San Francisco, and also the inaugural visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy at the University of Colorado Boulder in 2013-2014. Steve Hayward is the author of a two-volume narrative history of Ronald Reagan and his effect on American political life. The first volume entitled The Age of Reagan, The Fall of the Old Liberal Order, 1964 to 1980. Second volume, The Age of Reagan, The Conservative Counter-Revolution, 1980 to 1989. His other books include Mere environmentalism, meaning pure environmentalism, a biblical perspective on humans and the natural world, Churchill on leadership, topic in the movies recently, and greatness, Reagan, Churchill, and the making of modern statesmen. And I have in my hands his most recent book, Patriotism is Not Enough, Harry Jaffa, Walter Burns, and the arguments that redefined American conservatism. Steve is also one of the set of writers who comprise the Powerline blog, a prominent internet presence in conservative political and policy debates. And on that blog, you can find him drawing on his past writing and thinking from his AEI days on political economy and economic policy, also his work on environmental and climate change issues, as well as larger ideas about the American conservative movement and statesmanship. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Hayward. Thanks. Oh, I'm going to take some I'm going to take some water with me. Experience usually shows that after about 10 minutes, you need some, right? So let me get set up here just real quick. Little clock going. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, so friends of mine who uh, haven't sort of kept up 
kept up with for a long time, they say, wait a minute, you're where? Seriously, Berkeley? Are you, you know, I always say I'm an inmate these days at UC Berkeley and, and enjoying it immensely. Uh, uh, but I think what's uh, not clear at all from the, the biographical summary is that uh, being a college professor is actually a third career for me. Um, just very briefly, I was a reporter and journalist right out of college working for some local newspapers uh, and then a local magazine in Southern California. And then in a fit of something, I decided to go to graduate school in political science. Wasn't even sure I'd finish necessarily, but I thought if you're going to be a good journalist and later a book author, what I really wanted to be, I needed to know more. Uh, and it's a little bit like running a marathon. I did four of those once when I was younger and thinner. Uh, and you know, after you get to 20 miles, you figure, well, I may as well finish. So I finished my PhD. But instead of going into academia, I then spent 25 years in the public policy think tank world until I finally realized that I'd had enough of Washington, DC. I, it wasn't quite crazy enough. I wanted to go to Berkeley or somewhere like that, right? So I thought, oh, I'll go you know, try life in the classroom, which I'm enjoying immensely. Um, one of my mentors in journalism right out of college was the late M. Stanton Evans, legendary conservative journalist. And he used to say about Washington that, especially about conservatives, he'd say, people come to Washington saying, this phrase has come back into fashion, that they're going to drain the swamp. But after a while, they discover it's a hot tub. And they get very comfortable there. And uh, I think it is an, uh, an occupational hazard for any type of person who goes to Washington. Uh, Potomac fever is something I was never quite stricken with, even though I enjoyed my time living there. Uh, it would not at all surprise me to see our current president wake up someday. He's capable of lots of changes, as we know, and say, gosh, I'm not sure it's a swamp. I, I, I think it's a wetland, right? something like that. Uh, well, since I have this unorthodox career, I actually want to take an unorthodox approach to the wider problem that the conference is considering. I'm not going to say that much about free speech directly. I want to I'll put it in a larger context if I can. And I'm going to begin with my conclusion, which I don't usually do, but I want to set a high bar for laying out a, I hope, a, a line of argument that may not have occurred to people. And my conclusion is that uh, the School of Economic Thought and Leadership, Skettle, is that what we call it for short? By the way, I think your next swag bag ought to have a custom candy so it can go up head to head against Skittles. Um, anyway, uh, I think uh, Skittle is uh, one of the most significant experiments and in innovation in higher education today. Uh, and as I, I say, I'm going to work into that conclusion. Uh, and I, I gave, a, I don't know if it's in the program, but I told Paul that my title was going to be uh, The Intellectual Suicide of the University, uh, colon, Causes and Remedies. And that may seem like an overwrought opening theme. Right now, colleges and universities are at record enrollment levels. And recently, colleges and universities uh, reported the record year for fundraising in 2017. So what's the problem? Um, beneath the surface, though, I think there are signs of great trouble. Uh, and in fact, the Wall Street Journal just this morning reported some interesting news that fits in very closely with the last part of my analysis, and I'll come to that in due course. Um, but I worry that universities are on the road to becoming something very different than what they've been. So it's not news that in recent years, campuses today have been at a boil that we haven't seen since the 1960s over issues of identity, safety, and security the acceptable limits of provocative speech and ideological diversity. And I'm rather frustrated that a lot of the discussion has become repetitive and has become stuck in a rut. And I like to break out of familiar ruts if I can. Uh, so I think a lot of discussions about what is hate speech, uh, what is, you know, how, how should we think about the issues of diversity and inclusion, uh, only scratch the surface. I think the real uh, hidden not only hidden causes, but unperceived causes uh, uh, of um, the, the polarization we see on campus uh, uh, lie deeper. So the basic problem, I think, uh, to restate it succinctly is this. Universities, I think everyone would agree, ought to be the best institutions for conducting serious discussion and sober debate about controversial problems in our time. And instead, they are becoming some of the worst institutions for doing it. I think this is pretty obvious. And I think they're making some of our broader divisions worse. Now, a lot of critics, and not just critics on the right, uh, have attributed most of the blame for this on 
I guess you put it this way, sort of a newly emboldened ideological extremism of the campus left, what we used to call quite a long time ago, you know, political correctness. You might say political correctness on steroids or something. I think there's a, a bit to that explanation, but I think it's not complete. You know, universities have always been liberal, often deeply left in a lot of its precincts, and that's not new. Uh, I know that conservative complaints about the liberalism of universities go back at least to the 1930s, and probably before that, right? Um, so what's new and different about today? Well, I think there are three factors that I want to explain and knit together. I'll summarize them first before then breaking them down. Uh, first, I think we should acknowledge right off the bat that the fundamental claims that emanate from some of the most controversial departments, the various studies departments, African American studies, women's studies, gender studies, ethnic studies, sometimes cultural studies, right? Uh, the fundamental claims of these departments are correct. More about that presently. Uh, I think that the, the sort of fanatical and often obscurantist, uh, obscurantist ways these grievances are often expressed are the result of the second unappreciated factor. And that's the role of group polarization in intellectual life. And I think those effects are more severe on campus than they are in the wider world of the polarization of America that's much on everyone's mind these days. And I think this is not very well uh, recognized and appreciated either. A third and perhaps least appreciated, I think the ever-increasing specialty of academic inquiry, especially at large research universities, whether it's Berkeley or Arizona State, and some of the private universities, you know, Harvard and Yale, which are very large, uh, I think that they have degraded the intellectual capacities of universities, uh, especially the humanities and social sciences, to conduct sensible debate and discussion on our divisive problems. Uh, that, too, requires some explanation. And all of these factors come together in, to me, the doubts we're seeing expressed about the nature and status of free speech on campus. But not just on campus. It's also happening at Google, which perhaps not coincidentally refers to its headquarters as a campus. Maybe they want to rethink that. So let me go through these uh, in some order and explain what I mean. Um, so first. You know, with the notable and important exception of truly vile racialists like Richard Spencer, is there anyone who disagrees with the basic claim that women and minorities have experienced massive injustice and discrimination in American history and still face a, quite a bit today? It's eminently reasonable to say that progress to date is insufficient. But from an awful lot of the discourse on campus today, you'd think that things have never been worse for women and minorities than they are now, especially when you read about the various, uh, as I put it, sort of Inspector Yaver-like hunts for micro and nano aggressions, uh, often inspired by highly, I think, specious and impenetrable postmodern doctrines and also some rather dodgy social science. I think maybe a helpful clue about how to sort this out and think of it differently is found in the understanding of heresy from the Middle Ages. If you go back to the Thomists and other people of that period, uh, heresy was not a complete falsehood or something that was wrong. Rather, it was a part of the truth blown up out of proportion or exaggerated. Or another way of thinking about it, if you like uh, Gresham's Law and Economics, which is bad money chases out good money, I think extremist scholarship has driven out sensible treatment of social controversies and that, uh, uh, that makes robust debate harder. And so we have ended up with a lot of highly ideological approaches that explain everything in terms of a pervasive, systemic, structural oppression. Uh, but it's not content with that. It condemns any dissent from orthodoxy in the most highly charged and morally censorious ways. So I recently came across, just a couple weeks ago, a rather startling article by a second-year student at Columbia University named Coleman Hughes. It was a long piece, and I can share the link for it if anybody wants, or maybe put it on the website, I don't know. I'm just going to share four paragraphs with you, because I think they're quite striking. Here's Coleman Hughes, again, second-year student at Columbia right now. As a second-year undergrad student at Columbia University, I've noticed that two of my courses this semester differ greatly. One is a generic introductory philosophy course in which we read classic papers in the philosophy of mind, identity, and morality. 
The second philosophy course mainly covered feminist epistemology and queer theory in which we learned the core principles of intersectional feminism, queer theory, and feminist epistemology. Leaving aside what is taught, the courses greatly differ in how they're taught. In the generic intro course, we'll read some philosopher, say Thomas Nagel, and learn his arguments well enough to repeat them, and then spend much of the class exposing any weakness that Nagel's argument might have. We don't hold anyone's views as sacred or even special. We debate with one another. I even argue with the professor at times, imagine that. <laughs> The prevailing mood encourages friendly but lively debate. It's challenging and good-natured. Every Monday and Wednesday, I leave my generic introductory course and go straight to the second, where the mood is strikingly different. We read some philosopher, say Foucault, and learn his arguments. But rarely does a single person even ask a question to say nothing of making a critique. On the exceedingly rare occasion that a student asks a question that could potentially contradict what's being taught, the professor has a mysterious way of answering without ever suggesting that the argument could simply have a weakness. Of the seven philosophy courses I've taken at Columbia so far, not a single one has operated even close to this way. Philosophy professors are always the first to point out logical weaknesses, strong counterarguments, and alternative points of view, even when they fundamentally agree with the course material. In this class, I got the sense that the professor was wedded to the material such that a critique of material would have been synonymous with a critique of her. As hyperbolic as this might sound, voicing a strong pushback against any idea that the professor favored was nearly unthinkable. Last short conclusion from what I'm going to borrow from Mr. Hughes. The professor once said that all students of color are victims of oppression. I'm black and I view myself in no such way, but I didn't dare say so in the moment because I felt a silent pressure not to. Now, there's much more that's extraordinary, and I think frankly scandalous in the complete article from Mr. Hughes, but this is enough to illustrate my point that this is a recipe and a road to the intellectual suicide of universities. So how did we come to this pass? which, as I suggest, now goes beyond the historic left-leaning disposition of universities observable for decades. I think the explanation is surprisingly simple and is best explained uh, by one of the most formidable thinkers on the center left today, and that's Cass Sunstein of Harvard Law School. Uh, some years ago, he wrote an interesting paper called The Law of Group Polarization, where he went beyond the usual literature of groupthink. Uh, and he explored how homogeneous groups of people will become more extreme the more they deliberate together. And he said that will degrade deliberation. Uh, he was prompted to write this article, he said, because he was surprised at how little it was studied. I mean, he went widely to see what literature could bear on the question, but people weren't concentrating on the, the, you know, the, the unified question that it raised. So I quote him here. Members of a deliberating group move toward a more extreme point of view in whatever direction is indicated by the member's pre-deliberation strategy, close quote. In other words, it's not at all to be surprised, or we shouldn't be surprised, that a homogeneous group of academics concerned with the problems of racism or sexism should, deliberating in isolation, become more extreme in their outlook, finally offering sweeping categorical generalizations that explain just about everything. One of the implications, Sunstein went on to argue, is that, quote, social homogeneity can be quite damaging to good deliberation. When people are hearing echoes of their own voices, the consequence may be far more than support and reinforcement. Particular forms of homogeneity can be breeding grounds for unjustified extremism, even fanaticism. And he says it creates sort of social cascades within groups, right? culminating in what he calls um, the dominance of conformity. If that phrase doesn't describe the atmosphere of lots of our campuses today, I don't know what does. I think we need to add one more troublesome dimension to this line of analysis. Um, if you go back to the 1960s, when the first demands were being made initially to set up black studies programs or departments, um, and then later some of the other ones like it, there was a vigorous debate in faculty meetings and curriculum committees about whether such new initiatives should be included inside existing departments. In other words, black studies and political science, history, 
uh, philosophy, anthropology, psychology, so forth, sociology, right? Or whether they should be standalone departments operating just like other traditional uh, uh, topical disciplines. And there were strongly put arguments on both sides of this. And what we got in practice was both. Today, you find a lot of faculty with joint appointments in traditional departments, along with primary appointments in you know, gender studies or African American studies. It works out very well for a lot of departments, and for administrations, I think, kind of like it, because you get two for the price of one, right? Um, and it's, so it's quite typical today to go through the humanities and social science and find several faculty members, in a large department anyway, who say their main focus is uh, you know, race, class, and gender, and its close correlates, post-structural analysis, post-colonial perspectives, and so forth. Uh, now, here's the little secret of the social sciences and humanities. It's unknown off campus, for those of you who aren't academics. I expect this point will be controversial, but I think I can prove this if I tried hard enough. Most of the faculty, including most liberal members of the faculty, do not take seriously their radical colleagues in these separate departments. And they regard them with benign neglect. They will deny this if asked, of course, but I, you know, I, at some point, enough anecdotes become data. And I've been collecting them for a long time. One reason for this is easy to grasp and, and reasonable in one sense. Uh, you know, in political science, we talk about the median voter. Think now about the median college professor, who's a liberal of some type or description, right? And so they sympathize with, as I suggested earlier, the basic grievances of women and minorities. Um, and they don't really have any fundamental objection to the academic enterprise as such. And in most cases, they act from sincere goodwill uh, toward what we nowadays call marginalized groups and their academic champions. But there's a second factor at work. That's the generous description. The other problem is there's no upside to resisting the excesses that have come. And there's a lot of downside. I mean, you know, we have Brett Weinstein here, who's a case study in this. Um, the one I'm following, because uh, I've gotten to know him, is Mark Lilla at Columbia University. Dedicated liberal, partisan Democrat by his own public proud profession. And yet, after he wrote an op-ed article in the New York Times after the election, raising doubts about the way identity politics has played out in the election that he was dismayed at how it came out, was attacked by one of his faculty colleagues as a white supremacist. She called him David Duke in academic garb. There's a finely reasoned argument in place there, right? But that's what happens. And it, you know, uh, uh, OK, so there it is. So who wants to do that? Especially when you're a busy professor and you've got 15 or 20 other better things to do, right? Now, I think that a lot of the professors in the race, class, and gender catechism can sense that a lot of their colleagues don't regard them seriously and regard them with benign neglect. And I think that further fuels their righteous indignation, their self-imposed sense of oppression, and their mob mentality. I'll just give you two examples of this in action. Uh, four years ago, a student group occupied the president's office at Dartmouth College. And one of their main demands was that a queer studies course be required of all students in every department. Physics, chemistry, biology, seriously? And, and then, of course, um, the administration earnestly proclaimed that they would take up the proposal, appoint a committee to review the matter, and put it under advisement, and all of the other predictable platitudes. And then nothing was ever heard about it again for the simple reason that the idea is so clearly absurd that even a college president can grasp it. <laughs> uh, except perhaps George Bridges at Evergreen State. He'd probably go for it. I think maybe he has, actually. OK. Uh, meanwhile, at a recent meeting of the American Economics Association, several panels were disrupted by protesters condemning this discipline for not including perspectives of race, class, and gender, and demanding it be included in economics curricula. By the way, the panels interrupted were usually the sort of liberals like Emmanuel Says from, you know, from UC Berkeley, who's, these are panels on income inequality that a lot of economists study. Those are the panels they decided to disrupt. It wasn't the right kind of equality, apparently. And there's more of this kind of thing. And there's a comic aspect to this, which may occur to you. 
for, an, for an ideology that marks out colonialism as a preeminent sin of Western racism and oppression, it's ironic that the forces of leftist conformity do not perceive their own academic imperialism at work. It's not content to reside in their own departments. They want to be embedded in every single other one as well. Now, it's often suggested today that the dearth of conservative or non-liberal faculty uh, is a leading cause of the recent descent into campus extremism and conformism. And this is a view, by the way, that increasingly finds favor with a lot of liberal college presidents, most notably uh, Michael Roth of Wesleyan University, who wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal about a year and a half ago. He says, I, need, I want to try and find some conservatives for Wesleyan. And so I remember Michael Roth. He was a professor at Claremont when I was a graduate student 35 years ago, where he was very exercised on the fact that Ronald Reagan was uh, Hitler, right? That's, you know. So that's where his views, uh, I don't think he's changed his views a lot. But running a college, he's dismayed at what's happened. Interesting guy, by the way. I mean, I mentioned that detail about him, but I always found him interesting to listen to. And I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, quietly, sotto voce of other college presidents, prominent institutions you could mention who privately think the same thing, but have been reluctant to say so publicly. Now, we have good data on how the number of conservative faculty in the humanities and social sciences has declined precipitously over the last 25 years, and the reasons for this are hotly contested. But I don't think that's necessarily the most salient factor in some of the campus trends. I think a larger factor is the dynamic of the modern research university, which I think is also had a cascading effect, uh, not downward is not the right word, but I think it's affected the smaller private liberal arts colleges too. And that's my third point. So not only have the number of conservative professors in the social sciences and humanities declined in the last 25 years, the number of students majoring in the humanities and social sciences has declined by, I think, two thirds since 1970, 75. A lot of that decline precedes the economic crisis of 10 years ago. It was well entrained before that came along. Um, the one exception in the social sciences is economics, of course. I'll say more about that in a moment. Now, a lot of the old departments have been able to maintain themselves pretty well because of rising student enrollments. But if you actually look at the numbers, at a lot of places, political science, sociology, they're in relative decline to business, economics, STEM subjects. Right. Um, so there's a lot more can be said about that. Um, but I want to reflect a little bit further on sort of the, the nature of the modern research university and the effect it's had. Let me do it this way. So I've been dishing pretty hard on the special studies departments, you know, African American studies and so forth. Let me say one more thing in their favor as a means of drawing out the problem I'm trying to get at. Why are many students drawn to some of these very radicalized departments? I think the answer is quite simple, and in one sense, praiseworthy. These programs raise the problem of justice and injustice in a direct and straightforward way, while other social sciences uh, and a lot of the humanities departments no longer do so, or they do so only very poorly. However tendentious we might find the accounts of injustice, uh, however inadequate may be the proposed remedies, at least the various studies departments speak to a longing in the soul of the young uh, to engage the moral problems of justice and injustice in our world. I thought for like, one of these days I'm going to write an article with the headline, One Cheer for Ward Churchill, to, to really go through this point in some detail. If you remember that guy from, his, his name's kind of faded, but 10 years ago he was hot property, right? Um, so you get you know, passionate, um, energetic, enthusiastic calls for justice. By contrast, from the political science or sociology departments today, you mostly get regression models. I think the relative sterility of the old line social sciences and the dead end historicism of a lot of the humanities is not lost on students. And that's why so many of them have flown in, uh, have, have fled in droves from those majors. Now, I could say much more about this aspect of the social sciences and humanities, and the tussles over methodology are not new, um, even within the disciplines themselves. The point is this. The modern research university tends toward ever-increasing specialization and emphasizes the discovery of new knowledge above teaching. 
Incidentally, just this, this week, I stumbled across some curious news that a lot of economics departments are doing two things right now. They're splitting into two parts, actually two departments. Sort of general economics, they'll call it, and then uh, quantitative econometrics. And sometimes both departments, but certainly quantitative econometrics, are then applying to the federal government to change their official classification to be a STEM subject. I think this is partly the economists want to disassociate themselves from the other social sciences um, uh, and other departments that sort of split into more specialties, right? Um, so obviously the emphasis on new knowledge is entirely appropriate for a large research university, but I think it comes at a cost. And maybe the best way to get at this is to cast your mind back for a moment to 1943 when Harvard produced its report called The General Education in a Free Society, otherwise known as the Red Book. Now, the Red Book was aiming ironically at the needs of the expected increase in the diversity of the student body after the war, and also at the assimilation of immigrants, a phrase that you can use at your peril at a lot of college campuses today. In other words, the Red Book was written with an eye toward a problem that's being talked about a lot generally today, which is the need for serious general civic education. Now, Harvard's president at the time was James Bryan Conant, and he wasn't entirely happy with the Red Book because he presciently thought, in my mind, that the specialist of an elite research university would not be very good at general education. Indeed, he thought that Harvard perhaps ought to maintain a separate teaching faculty for its civic education functions. I think he was on to something. And one thing you note is that the uh, general education program at Harvard withered by degrees almost from the beginning and it was finally abandoned in the 1960s, partly because its elite research faculty didn't really want to teach those courses. And my hunch is, you know, the old freshman Western civilization survey, my hunch is when they did teach them, they probably weren't very good. I, I just sense somewhat from the usual conservative theme that Western civilization requirements were killed because of an attack and hatred of civilization by the left. I actually don't think that's the main reason. I think too many of those classes were deadly boring. Now, a lot of colleges boast, I mean, there may be one here, that they have a core curriculum now. They brought it back. But if you look at most of these, they're just a smorgasbord of specialty classes, usually indistinguishable from upper division classes in the various departments. They're not even close to what the Red Book had in mind. Now, there are, of course, many important exceptions to this. Uh, Columbia University still has its core curriculum, though it's controversial with guess who. Uh, Yale still has its directed studies program uh, as an option for students. Reed College, where I doubt there's a faculty member much to the right of Bernie Sanders, uh, has a, a core Western civilization requirement, which, as people know, has become controversial there. Um, uh, but I do think that uh, the competitive pressures and conventions of academia today, and this is something that, you know, Josh, you might want to study this for your next book. I think it has changed the mode of operation and increased the specialization of professors at private liberal arts colleges, which were always the alternative for students who wanted a liberal arts education. Uh, if you wanted that old style education, you would go to you know, Middlebury, which I think actually is pretty good at from what I've heard in some respects, or, or you know, Kenyon or Oberlin or places like that. But I think it's slipping away pretty fast. So there's an atrophy going on here. Um, let me say one thing here. I'm probably going on a little longer than I expected, but let me say one thing here that, that why this is a background of the free speech controversy. If you, and I've gone over this pretty quickly, but right now, um, arising out of the sort of ideological kaleidoscope twisting around at universities, we now have two, as I make them out, uh, attacks on the idea or criticisms of the idea of free speech. One of them I call um, metaphysical and the other empirical. And they're kind of contradictory, but they form a classic pincer movement. The metaphysical one runs something like this. Uh, you know, free speech is really just a tool of oppression for the people with power, right? Um, it's not a new idea. It goes back at least to Marcuse, although I argue that almost all the ideas that get wrapped up with these linguistic critiques, you actually find in Plato's dialogues. Certainly, it's some aspects of this are clearly in the Republic, in the Gorgias, in the Phaedrus. Nobody reads those anymore. And so they think it is news to say that language can be used as a tool uh, to you know, gain and maintain power. Um, 
And there are lots of variations of this, you know, as, as a version of critical legal studies in the legal academy. Uh, a lot of people aren't much swayed by theory. That's why we have social science. And so there's an empirical case emerging very rapidly that fascinates me. And so I should say that what I call the metaphysical account challenges the sort of liberal tradition wholesale. It rejects John Stuart Mill and Milton and so forth. Uh, but the empirical case doesn't do that. It accepts entirely the liberal tradition of freedom of expression, freedom of inquiry, but it anchors the critique in the notion of harm, right? I mean, the old John Stuart Mill line is, uh, uh, you know, your liberty ends where you physically harm another person. So the way this works now is uh, you'll hear students say, and you know, some of their uh, uh, academic mentors that, you know, Ben Shapiro or Milo represent violence, literal violence. Literal as an actual, not literal as in figurative, the way literally is literally misused all the time right now, right? Uh, and they, and there's, there's some social science studies behind this that, uh, that, that trace it out something like this. Um, uh, you know, hate speech or these controversial speakers, they, they uh, increase stress levels, they make people anxious. You can trace out actual health effects from this that starts to look like physical harm from words. Now, uh, I, I think this needs to play out a lot longer. I'm rather skeptical of this. Uh, is uh, having Ben Shapiro in the same square mile with you when you're not even in the hall, is that really more stressful than, oh, I don't know, a midterm exam? You know, a term paper deadline? Or if you're a low income student, the financial pressures you bear, that can't be. That's that. So, um, but even if you take this at full face value, which I think we should start with that and think this through a little bit, is trying to shield students from the stress that comes with disagreeable ideas really a sensible idea? You know, I mentioned that uh, in a previous life I wrote a lot about uh, the Clean Air Act. I wrote a whole book about the Clean Air Act about 12 years ago. And one of the things I got curious about, and I think there's a pretty good analogy here, is the relation between falling air pollution levels, and they fall a lot, and rising childhood asthma levels, which have been going up a lot at the same time. And the correlations are very strange. In California, you find the second highest asthma rate among children is in Marin County. Very rich, very white, very low air pollution, always. Uh, the first highest is in Fresno County. Much poorer, much higher air pollution levels. And so the correlations are not there. But I got curious about the medical literature. And increasingly, there's a lot of literature that suggests that to the extent that asthma is partly an autoimmune disease, one of the reasons, and so why it's so prevalent in children is their immune systems aren't fully developed, that one of the reasons this is happening is that, uh, this is be a familiar critique in other contexts, kids don't get outside enough. They're doing their video games and being on their computers. They're not rolling around in the dirt outside and breathing in microbes and exposing themselves to things that make their immune systems more robust. As I say, there's a lot of literature on this in the medical community. I wonder if trying to say there's an empirical that, you know, the stress from disagreeable speakers, even hate speech, is not creating an intellectual autoimmune deficiency in our students today, which is why even if this research is correct, it ought to be, in my mind, rejected. Okay, I'll draw to a conclusion here. I've only just scratched the surface, and some of the defects I've outlined here at first glance might suggest I think there should be wholesale reform and remedies. That's not going to happen. Um, and I don't think we're likely to suff, uh, sand off the rough edges yet. There may be a market test. We know at the University of Missouri that applications are way down. Evergreen State applications are way down. A lot of students see these circuses and say, I'm not going to go there. At a big university like Berkeley, you can avoid it and just do engineering and science and business and so forth. Um, but uh, also, um, universities, this will sound odd perhaps, universities are actually very reactionary institutions. My witness for this is the University of California's legendary president, Clark Kerr, from back in the 60s, who once remarked, quote, few institutions are so conservative as the universities about their own affairs while their members are so liberal about the affairs of others. I think he had that nailed. Um, or maybe another historical analogy I use is, uh, some people describe universities today as something of a cartel. 
And mostly what they're thinking about is the rising cost of education, which has risen faster than health care costs, right? Faster than just about everything else. Ought to be a bigger scandal than it is, and the reasons for this are, are murky and anyway. Uh, but I think a better analogy, which is related to cartels, is that uh, universities intellectually are something of a monopoly. And, you know, so monopolies stifle competition, and they serve consumers poorly, and they raise prices. But, of course, the other problem with monopolies is they stagnate and suppress innovation. And that's what I think has happened in a lot of universities. I think a lot of the humanities and social sciences uh, are... It's a mixed bag and lots of exceptions and shadings and gradations, of course, but I think they uh, have stagnated in a lot of ways. And I think what is happening is we're going to see universities having a de facto divorce. The STEM fields and the economists who can go with them are going to break off. They'll be very popular. That's where you get the jobs, right? They're going to get the money and the love from legislatures and donors and other practical disciplines, business. Uh, and the humanities and social sciences uh, are going to wither. In fact, that's the story in the Wall Street Journal this morning, which looked at uh, data from sort of lower-ranked universities, lower-tier universities. They're struggling to, to keep students. So what are they doing? A lot of them are shrinking their social sciences. They mentioned political science, history, arts, music. And what are they doing? Building up computer sciences, business, economics. They're going to become more like trade schools. Now, I think this is going to climb up the food chain of universities. It'll never get to Harvard and Yale. They're too rich, and they can always attract the best faculty, and they can always raise tons of money. Uh, but I think that will climb up the food chain, and that'll be a very bad thing, I think. So if you accept my idea of universities as monopolies in need of competition, that rather than reform them or break them up, standard oil style, um, uh, we want competition of ideas, methodological competition. It doesn't have to be ideological, by the way. I think interdisciplinary approaches, and now I think you'll see why I led the way I did. It's why I think what Skettle represents is competition, a different model for educating students. And I think it's important that it's a big program. There's lots of small programs around that are very good, but they're usually one-person operations. You know, John Tomasi's project at Brown, Harvey Mansfield will be with us tomorrow, his Center for Constitutional Government at Harvard. Uh, but there's very few, there are very few programs like this one anywhere else. I can only think of one that's roughly comparable in my mind. I may have missed some. And it's the Thomas Jefferson Center for the uh, Study of Core Texts at UT Austin. Big program, has graduate students, fellowships, its own curriculum. Very popular with students. Long waiting list to get into all the classes they offer. Um, and I expect in the fullness of time that Skettle will have the same experience here at Arizona State, which is why I'm tempted to move here. Um, but I'll just close with this. Hats off to Arizona, Arizona legislature, trustees, administration, faculty who put it together. Congratulations. And I will stop now and take questions. Brick bats, federal grants. <laughs> And the way we want to do this is at the microphone, because the, this is being recorded for PBS. So we we'll want to hear from people who say stuff. I'm just so. going to make an opening remark yeah. to the question. So we, we would uh, prefer if you would just briefly identify yourself and to um, keep in mind the two rules of a short <laughs> question, that it should be short and it should be a question. And one question, please. And uh, everything is open for discussion except Steve's closing remarks. <laughs> Yeah, I always, uh, I always say, please use the Jeopardy rule and state, make your statement in the form of a question. That's the way I was say anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, Shay, hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Shay Kateri. I'm a senior here. And all those rules that Dr. Curry's made were uh, directed towards me. Uh, so about <laughs> one question, I'm very short. Also, growing up in Iran, I'm used to people in search of freedom moving to the west. This is the first time I've seen somebody moving to the east to find freedom. Mm. Uh, mm. And thank you, everybody, for being here. This school is really, it has changed my life. You were risking having an Alcibiades here. And <laughs> thanks to this school, dodge the bullet. <laughs> thanks to everybody. And uh, I, my, I have a question about, I was at Hoover Institution for a mm -hmm. seminar with uh, a, roughly 85 students. And yeah. this is Hoover Institution. This is right. not necessarily a very leftist place to be. <laughs> and I made a remark that I was called everything short of a fascist, that uh, 
Yes, it is great to have intellectual diversity at, uh, in academia. However, uh, it should be within the norms of liberalism, just like it is not okay to have a Nazi to to be on the faculty, not necessarily speak, but to be on the faculty, it is not also okay to have a communist. If somebody, ah. is, if somebody, if the purpose of academia is to educate liberal arts and liberal students, the faculty need to adhere to the basic principles of uh, liberalism. Uh, am I going too crazy here, or do I have a point? No, you know what? I actually think that argument is creditable, but deserves some sharpening. Um, so let's start with an irony. If you go back to the McCarthy period, and you know we were imposing loyalty oaths on faculty and maybe firing some if they were thought to be members of the Communist Party, and what was the defense made by not just people who might have been communists, but liberals was, wait, academic freedom, free speech. And it was conservatives who made the argument that, wait a minute, your right to free speech should be circumscribed by using your free speech to end everybody else's free speech if you win. Right, I mean, right? I mean, it's the object of a communist revolution is They'll win an election, and that will be the last election. OK, that argument makes some sense. The prudence of whether you need to do that is a different matter. Uh, so it's a theoretical argument. Now the, 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 we've changed sides. Now it's liberals who are saying, ah, the particular form of liberalism today, you know, if it doesn't conform to those kinds of principles, it should be. And it's conservatives who are now for unrestrained free speech. So that's an interesting little uh, uh, place uh, switching that's gone on. Uh, now, a little, the next refinement of the argument, I'm not going to go on very long on this, but the next refinement of the argument is there is, I think if you do the Venn diagram, there's some places where those arguments overlap. And we don't actually have very many intelligent discussions about this. Um, so the way I go about it is this way. Um, we talk about free speech and hate speech, and we get all kinds of tangles on the legal problems of trying to do hate speech, and we're going to talk about that, I gather, tomorrow. Uh, I like to say we ought to spend more time asking the questions in some of our classrooms. Are there any such things as closed questions in a liberal society? And now, nowadays, it's hard to talk about this because they're connected to the things that currently engage our passions, right? Uh, but I'm sort of fond of the late Wilmore Kendall, who at Yale used to argue in class that. Uh, and loved to rile up his students by saying, maybe Athens was right to have executed Socrates. Right? Socrates, we think of as the first victim of sort of establishment censorship of subversive speech, right? And is victim of it. And, and that's a great way of getting at the problem in the abstract before you get to the things that are on our minds, you know, women and minorities and colonial, all the rest, right? Um, and we don't do that very well anymore. Yale, by the way, ended up kicking Kendall out. But that's a famous story, buying out his contract because they couldn't stand him any longer, right? Um, uh, um, but, but as I say, there is an overlap between the way conservatives thought about this in the 50s and the way uh, liberals think about it today that hardly anybody has noticed except for weirdos like me. Um, I will say, just as I do follow a little bit of the, I mean, we have some law professors here who are way more equipped than I am. but. Um, I'm not a purist about the matter or an absolutist. I think the Supreme Court had it right on Chaplinsky, the fighting words doctrine. And I think we can make intelligible distinctions in a judicial way such that my opinion is I don't think the Supreme Court had it right when they said the Nazis could march in Skokie. Why did they pick Skokie? Because a lot of Jewish Holocaust survivors lived there. They didn't just want to have a march to express their views. They wanted to do it in the most offensive way possible in a way that, uh, uh, not a physical assault, but pretty darn close to it. Those aren't clear-cut matters. Uh, you know, at, at, out of, you know, my new dean at the law school at Berkeley is Erman Chemerinsky, and he's a free speech absolutist. And I the guy's very nice, but he's very left otherwise. And I said, you know, Erwin, I am to the left of you on this question. That's really hard to do, which he kind of likes. Anyway, someone else? Yeah. Hello, my <laughs> name is Maxime Quint. I study applied mathematics here at ASU. Mm. Uh, I noticed that most of my peers have not read any of the quote unquote great books from Plato to even considering Marx to Thomas Paine. Yeah. What do you think a school like Schedule can do to try and increase a great books education on campus? Oh, that, I think that's very simple. Just do it really well. 
I don't think, by the way, the great books are, should be required of everybody. I think, uh, I mean, you say your mathematics, uh, you know, uh, some people are just well suited to math and science and not much interested in discoursing about Plato, but it ought to be offered in a good way, in a serious, and, and that's what Skettle will do, is they'll do it well. And, and then, you know, you may like it. Um, I will tell a quick story about this. I say there are not many programs like this. So at Colorado, uh, when I got there, this is a funny story. I, I get to Colorado, it's a big place, you know, 40,000 students, and I get an email from a friend of mine who teaches in Europe, and he says, uh, Oh, you've been over to say hi to Wayne Ambler yet. So Wayne Ambler, is, uh, he's just retired, but he's a translator of Xenophon and a Xenophon scholar. And I'd never met him, but I knew his work. And I've actually assigned one of his translations of Xenophon in class a couple of times. And I didn't even know he was here. So I discovered that he was running this little thing at Colorado called the Herbst Center for Humanities for Engineers. So how'd this come about? Some guy named Herbst studied engineering, made a lot of money. In his retirement, he reflected back that he didn't really have very good humanities instruction, didn't take it seriously himself, and gave the university $20 million to start a program just for the engineering school, which is very big and very well known there. There emerged the usual tussle of the humanities department wanting to capture and control it, uh, this fairly typical academic organizational fight. They kept it independent. And I'll just state that my opinion is, is the curriculum at that little program is better and I think uh, it gets more enthusiasm from the students than the regular humanities departments. I, I mean, uh, people there will yell at me and scream and disagree, and there's obvious exceptions, but. Um, so there's an example of competition. There's competition within one university. Let a thousand flowers bloom. So, someone else? You want to try, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> University of Arizona, Steve and I. That rival school, yeah. A long way back together. And I would like to oh. remind you of what Professor Newman, one of our professors mm. we studied under, would say to another professor of ours, Harry Jaffa, your liberal credentials are safe with me. <laughs> I don't even, I can't even begin to understand what you mean by we should end debate about certain things. I, we should set up barriers on one end or ah. the other and have debate in the university only between the two extremes somewhere where we decide in the middle. Is that what you were saying? No, not really. And of course, I'm speaking extemporaneously and too quickly. And uh, what I mean is this. If you have that kind of argument on sort of a more theoretical level and abstract it a bit from a current controversy, uh, we might approach more thoughtfully how what we categorize as hate speech and whether or not it should be limited. And I leave the door open to the legal approaches and all this. I mean, another, I'm a little rusty on this, but I, you know, I read some of the cross-burning cases from the 1990s. I just think they're a mess. Because uh, remember, they, uh, the court said, Sandra Day O'Connor, I think, wrote the opinion in one of those cases, says, you know, cross-burning, that's actually, uh, you know, that can be expression. There was a cross burned in the movie, Mississippi Burning, right? And the unable to make the simplest distinction between an artistic representation and burning it on somebody's lawn or in a park. But I think that That's there's- That's not hard, I don't think. No, but I think there's a major difference between a really bad Supreme Court decision, which, as you know, I think most of them are. <laughs> right. Um, and and the, the larger issue, which is Jefferson, of course, um, you know, error is the only ah. thing that needs the support of government. Right. Uh, truth is great and will prevail. So somebody's a Nazi, somebody's a Marxist, somebody's a communist, whatever it might be, their ideas are dumb. And well, okay. yeah. leaving them out there for intelligent people to argue against is a much better way, I think, of handling it than saying we shouldn't discuss it. As a practical it matter, that's what I think. But I think I'm, as a theoretical matter. Well, okay. And I'm, less of a practical I'm matter. I'm trying to shake things up. And you're okay, I'm now, trying remember, to shake you up here. Now, of course, do remember, <laughs> uh, now we'll, we'll get too much an inside baseball here, but do remember that Harry Jaffa always used to complain about people who said they didn't want Leninists or conservatives in a political science department. He said, we should only have Leninists and conservatives and let them fight, which I, okay. Right, which, which is what Jaffa and Newman were. Yeah, okay, were, sit down, yes, Linda. Sorry. You've got, right. <laughs> I can do that to her, right? I've just been a sexist pig or something, but or patriarchal, I don't know, I've committed a bunch of sins. We'll just get you right. I asked this question at, at one of the last speaker series that we had, and uh, we got a great answer from it. Um, 
we're trying to get as many debates to happen on campus yeah. here and at, at the U of A, and, and I was just talking possibly at NAU as well. If you could think of two people right now in, in the world that yeah. would be dream debate partners here at ASU. You mean debate opponents, you mean? Or, debate yeah, opponents right. here at ASU. Who would they be and why? Yeah. Um, let's see. I would want to pair Judith Butler, who is one of the leading feminist theorists of our time, either with Camille Paglia or Christina Hoff Summers. Um, actually, we've been trying to set that up at Berkeley, and she's unenthusiastic about it. Some people, by the way, are you know, not into for debates. Or, and, and OK. Um, I wish, OK. So that would be the first one that would occur to me, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's the first one that leaps to mind, because I think that's one of the. Um, uh, maybe Jason Riley, the writer of the Wall Street Journal, um, and somebody, not Cornell West, but it would be uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Yeah, that would, be, that would be a great debate to have, uh, if you get the two of them. Yeah, yeah that, would be a, that would be a good one to have. Um, so there's two. I'll probably think of more. Someone else? We bring people out? Well, I threw a lot out there, and here we go. Okay, good. Hi, my name is David Lucier, and I live here in Tempe. And mm. um, anyway, I'm uh, invited by Paul over here for the evening, and appreciate that very much. Um, could you ex uh, explain to me, or or expound upon the uh, idea of the university as monopoly? I didn't quite get that. Yeah. Well, what I was. Uh, um, it yeah it connects to the idea of uh, you know the group think and and uh, um, you know, the law of group polarization I was explaining it earlier in the talk. Um, you combine that with the fact that conservative faculty and so non-liberal faculty, not just conservatives, but sort of old-fashioned moderates. Uh, I think of sort of uh, moderate liberals like uh, at Berkeley it would be people like Nelson Polsby, Aaron Wadowski, all Democrats, but people like them have disappeared from a lot of faculties, um, both in style and in a lot of ways. Anyway, um, uh, and uh, so you, know, you have, uh, as I say, this sort of climate of conformism. And so when you get a uh, uh, you know, sort of single opinions dominating, uh, you get you have intellectual stagnation. I mean, the whole problem with, uh, sure. think about it, the problem, I didn't see, right, I mean, I know a lot of the literature of Monopoly, but, you know, give me one example. Why did we not get cell phones in the 1980s when the technology existed in the 1950s? Well, because of the regulated telephone monopoly for 80 years. It wasn't until we finally smashed all that up that we got, you could actually buy your own phone. I love telling students about how you didn't actually used to own your phone. It was the phone companies. Right? If you wanted a new one, it had to be all beat up and broken or something. You couldn't get it. It was really hard to get a new one. And this is, you tell that to a, um, somebody today, and they can't believe it. Right? Or the, I talk about the trucking industry a lot. Mm -hmm. and People are amazed at what used to be known as the backhaul regulation. It existed in the 1980s. You all know that one? It uh, used to be under the old interstate commerce rules. If you went from Chicago to St. Louis in a truck, you had to drive back empty. What? I mean, that goes back to some feather bedding in the 1930s, and it made, might have made sense then, but it lasted for 50 years. That's what I mean by monopoly. You get stuck doing things that don't adapt to the modern world, don't allow for competition, don't allow for new creativity. Uh, so that's what I meant by monopoly. And is Skittle the answer? Yes. The solution? Yes, that's what I think, yeah. Cool. Things like it, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm not going to demand that people change their mind on the left. Ah, Berkeley. So, I lived there for about several years. And yeah. Lived as an artist there. For <laughs> well, there you go. This was right. a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for well, thanks, coming yeah. down. Appreciate it. Thanks. So we want to do maybe one more, or I think we've worn people out. If anybody last. Oh, OK. Maybe I'll just ask you to talk about what it was like to be maybe the lone conservative on campus in, in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, so well, actually, so here's the thing that people don't know. Um, Sorry, I'm Carol McNamara. <laughs> they're actually, and I found this at Berkeley, they're actually, the number of conservatives at a place like Berkeley or Colorado was not zero. I think Colorado identified about 20. Now, out of 1,000, it's not much, but the number isn't zero. 
Now, a lot of times you don't actually know they're there, and that's partly because in the research university they're teaching some very narrow, specific subject. It'll be, you know, Elizabethan literature from 1650 to 1670 or something like that. Um, or, you know, in political science, they're doing a lot of regression modeling, which, by the way, I mean, I threw shade on it, but I actually think is, I go to the methodology workshop every week at Berkeley, and I have fun, and I say more about that, you enjoy these stories. Um, they're really good at it, and I think it actually is useful stuff. I think the old sort of Russell Kirk conservative categorical hostility to social science was mistaken, should be rethought. Anyway, um, uh, but here's the thing, is that uh, there are fewer of conservative academics who become academic celebrities. And so right now, who's the biggest sort of right of center academic celebrity? It's this Jordan Peterson guy out of Canada, right? Who's been around a while, but suddenly he's you know almost literally world famous. Why? Well, he decided to pick a very public fight over the gender pronoun protocols, right? And uh, you know Harvey Mansfield's well known. Alan Bloom, of course, 30 years ago. Um, whereas I think you tend to have more academic celebrities from the left. You know Judith Butler, um, Howard Zinn when he was alive. Um, what's his Noam Chomsky, right? Uh, you know at, at Berkeley, Robert Reich, right? Who, by the way. Uh, he says, we need, he's, you know, he's a really nice guy. He says, I'm glad you're here. We need 10 more like you. He says, we need more conservatives. He loves to get out and debate. He'd be a good guy to have debate. Have him come and debate Stephen Moore. Reich is hard to get. He's really busy and in very high demand. Um, um, so, uh, and so at Berkeley, I've identified a number of conservatives that nobody knows are there. And by the way, I mean, uh, so uh, I was telling somebody this at dinner, I contrived, I won't go through all the steps involved, but I contrived when I arrived at Berkeley to get the daily, I'm a former journalist, right, I know how to do these things. I managed to plant indirectly a story in the Daily Cal student paper, front page news article with a nice picture and an editorial about what a horrible human being I am. I absolutely wanted to do that. Uh, and it had the predictable effect. Registrations for my courses were off the charts, <laughs> right? And, but I actually don't teach my classes from an ideological point of view. Before I became a known quantity, I would keep students guessing, usually successfully. Uh, and most of the conservative professors I know, I know, you know two in philosophy at Berkeley, one in English literature. Students don't necessarily know what their views are. And that's the right way to teach, by the way, I think. Um, and uh, so that's why I say it's not as bleak as people think. I actually think it is worse at smaller liberal arts colleges than the big public research universities. Uh, but as I say, that's a more complicated question. But we have the real expert on this, is Josh Dunn here, um, who's you know, done all the detective work on it. Maybe you'll talk about this some on your panel. But. Yeah, a little bit tomorrow. So, yeah. yeah, so they're actually out there. And there are a lot in the sciences. I learned after I got to Berkeley, I have this whole fan club in the physics department that are regular daily readers of my blog, and they take me out for coffee all the time. And they're really, you know, I love hanging out with these guys, but they're always talking way over my head, right? Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you to Steve uh, for a great opening for your closing remarks, a defense of Socratic uh, debate and discussion. I have a few uh, notes of thanks uh, and uh, announcing and thanking some people who are here uh, before we convene the evening. Um, if you look at the front of your programs, the members of the organizing committee that has planned this entire year of uh, lectures and, and this two-day conference as well are listed, um, all of our partners and, and uh, sponsors. Um, and then below that, uh, for which we're grateful, and I won't list all of them, but there are some members of the organizing committee who are here, including uh, Professor James Weinstein of the O'Connor College of Law here at ASU, and the deputy provost of the university, Steph Lindquist, who is uh, both a professor of law and a professor of political science at the university. So we're grateful that um, they made time to be with us. I do want to mention, um, and if I forget somebody, Carol, uh, correct me, I just want to briefly mention the staff of the school who have been, uh, faculty and staff who have been planning this year long series and then the, particularly this two day uh, conference. Uh, so that would include um, Dr. Carol McNamara who you just saw, our Associate Director for Public Programs and in the staff, uh, Melissa, Ty, Susan, Gala, uh, our student workers, who am I forgetting? Uh, Kim, did I forget Kim? I'm sorry, um, uh, our, new, uh, our newest staff member. So as you can guess, an enormous amount of work goes into an event just like 
this evening alone, let alone um, the following two days. Um, thank you to all the speakers who are here this evening and traveled so far to be with us. We look forward to your contributions in the next couple of days. Uh, we have ASU students and students from around the country who are speaking on panels. Um, we have our two visiting scholars with us uh, tonight who have been with the school uh, these past two weeks. Um, Professor Allison Stanger of Middlebury College and Professor Michael Kraus of Middlebury College. Um, we have leaders from the community here, um, members of the state legislature who were going to be here and, and some of them didn't show up, uh, but we also have the, the president of the State Board of Regents uh, with us here and other uh, leaders and members in the community, uh, in the Phoenix area and, and beyond. So Carol, unless I'm forgetting something, um, I'll say a good evening to all of you and in the programs you can see that um, we hope to see most of you Certainly those of you who are on the program, we host, hope to see you <coughs> at, uh, when we reconvene at 10.30 in the morning, tomorrow morning, on this campus in uh, what is called the New Student Pavilion. Thank you very much for a delightful evening, and one more round of applause, and thanks, please, for our speaker, Steve Hayward. <laughs>